A couple of weeks ago, when Brother Jerry was in uh, Mississippi, I believe, the church collectively decided to go to a sister church, Glorious Kingdom, and it was a wonderful service. And Brother John Wallace preached like he usually preached, as you all know. He said many wonderful things, but the one phrase that he said that stuck with me to this day and that I've been thinking about for the past weeks is putting in the effort, putting in the effort. He was talking about the strength that God gives us and how that is our foundation to put in the effort. And we always can put in more. We never put in the full amount that we have. We place these invisible borders in front of us. Subconsciously, we, we make these boundaries that we don't even think that we can conquer, that we put ourselves in a box sometimes. But we have the strength to put in a little bit more effort into everything we do and the blessings will just flourish from that. He talked about putting in the effort, whether it's your relationships with your friends. If they're not going too well, put in a little bit more effort and they'll get better. 
If you're having a little rough patch in your marriage, put in a little bit more effort and they'll get better. If you're having a dispute with someone, put in the effort. All of these simple things that we go through in our lives are so easily solved with just a little bit of effort and a little bit of grace from God. Now today what I would like to talk about is the strength that we receive from God um, and why, why we place our trust in him. If you guys, if you would like to turn with me to Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2. We'll go to uh, verse 9. In the first chapter, in the first half of the second chapter, um, Paul, who we assume is the author here, is talking about the placement of Jesus a little bit lower than the angels, where God placed him a little bit lower than the angels, but still placed everything under him. And he rose to eventually become the high priest. So we'll start from the ninth verse. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the, suf- for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he be the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The last phrase, taste death for every man. That, the other night I was reading that, and I was stuck on that for the longest time. I can't imagine tasting death once. But tasting it for every man's death puts it in another perspective, for me at least. For it became him, sin, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Nothing is made perfect, at least in this life, nothing is made perfect instantly. Typically there's a trial, we hear of trial by fire. When you make a glass vase, it is tried by the fire and molded and shaped. In our lives, we are shaped by our trials and our tribulations. They strengthen us, sometimes weaken us. They rearrange us sometimes. But all throughout our sufferings, we are made perfect through him. Another um, We place our trust in him because of who he is and because of what we've learned from this, from other ministers and, and from reading. And the strength that we gather from these words are just a portion of the, of the true strength that he has to offer us. And that is there if we just go to him and ask for it. That's right. It's right before our eyes, but we often stop short and don't reach a little further for that. In Corinthians chapter 2 verse, I'm sorry, chapter 1 verse 20. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in, and in him, amen, right. unto the glory of God by us. He's never lied to us. He will never lie to us. And still we don't take him at his word sometimes, that he'll always be there for us. That no matter what happens, he's there. We never take, at least I don't ever take, the true strength from these words. We, we sell them short, I feel, sometimes. We don't gather what we truly can from them. And I probably can't describe it in such a way that we can. But I hope that if we read this and we pray on it, that we can gather the true strength from this, that we can put in a little bit more effort in our day-to-day lives and the little things, and we'll excel and grow in grace and knowledge. I hope um, the short, some of the short words that I said to you are, will stay with you and maybe you will uh, learn something and take something from those. Thank you. You know, a verse in the Philippian letter that is often quoted and thrown out there and 
sometimes I think it even is, is positioned as a, a badge of honor, um, sometimes in the, in the world, as I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Brother Thomas has set before us a, a thought that we must surely ponder. Do we truly believe that we can do all things through Christ? And is it his strength that we lean upon? Is it our strength plus his strength? Or is it his strength? For in and of ourselves, we can do no good thing. It is just not possible. And yet, it's an amazing thing when you consider how man in our carnal condition strives continually to put value in that which we do. And the reality of the matter is that in our very best effort, we're just an unprofitable servant. But all through Christ, we can do all things through him that strengthen us up, that we would understand that he is the captain of our salvation. He is the leader. He is the forefront. He's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning of it. He's the end of it. What do we have to glory in? We have nothing to glory in. The Bible says, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. We have much to glory in this morning in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the book of Hebrews, where Brother Thomas was reading, it's an amazing thing to consider. And I'm going to just make this point and then move on, I trust, to that which is upon our heart, and I believe it will harmonize uh, with that that Brother Thomas has set before us. But in verse 9, let us stop for a moment and consider the blessing that we have in our heart where we can say, but we see Jesus. You didn't come here to see me this morning, and I didn't come here to see you. I love you, and it's good to see you, and I'm thankful to see you. And it causes my heart to rejoice when I see you. When I drove on the grounds and, and I, I looked up and I saw Sister Vivian and her grandson sitting on the porch at, at quarter to ten, I, my heart jumped with gladness. And my heart was wonderful to know we were going to worship today, together today. And then as we all came together, I trust that we recognize the blessing that we have in, in anticipating and in the realization of being together and seeing one another in the worship of the Lord. But we didn't come here to see one another and to be with one another. I trust. If you did, you're going to leave disappointed. <laughs> you're going to leave lacking. But we came that we might see Jesus. That we might be able to look beyond uh, that which stands before and see our Lord high and lifted up recognizing that God has, through the work of Christ, he has rent the veil from top to bottom that we might look in and see the glory of the Lord. What a blessing. What a, what a place of honor we occupy uh, in, in the service of God today. And Brother Thomas made a point that requires daily consideration. All that we would put forth the very best that we have. Is he not worthy of the best that we have? I trust this morning we recognize that we should always be, when we bow in prayer, that we should be looking for, uh, putting forth the best prayer that we've ever prayed. It may be your last one, by the way. It might be your last one. Don't you want it to be the best? Do we go into the bower of prayer and we just kind of go through the motions and this is something, listen, good habits are good to keep. You ought to keep them. You ought to have a prayer life. It should be a regular, um, hab habitual thing uh, in your life. Uh, but let us stop short of making it just that, um, that we would, as we bow down to the throne of God's grace, as we bow before the very King of glory, that we would bow before him and bring forth the best that we have. Every opportunity that we have. That our prayer would be fervent. It would be boiling over. And that God would receive honor, praise, and glory. It's a form of worship. And he's, he is worthy of the very best effort that we can put forth in worship in every, in every way. That we would bring fall short in no way according to what we can do. Recognizing we can do nothing in his sight. That it would be pleasing unto him if it is not seasoned by the grace of Almighty God. Oh, but what a blessing it is. 
when we do come together and our hearts are open and pure and we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and in, in uh, our obedience, he blesses us and exalts us to come up nigh unto him. And what a wonderful place to occupy. And it's a place of peace and joy and, and love and contentment. We, see, we came this morning to see Jesus. And you're blessed this morning. You're blessed every day of your life that you would see him. The one who sticketh closer than a brother. The one that set brotherly love before you that we might continue in it. He says he was made a little lower than the angels. I want you to consider this morning, and, I, and it's not my intent to stay here. We started a little early on purpose. Uh, but consider this. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. This is the God of all grace. God manifests in the flesh, a condescended from his place in heaven and immortal glory, a place there is none higher, and he condescended uh, to, the, to this lowest state, if you will, and he suffered death uh, of, in our room and in our stead. And in that sense, he was made a little lower than the angels uh, in that he died upon the cross of Calvary, and he died for you and atone for the debt of sin for the elect family of God. He condescended. Consider that. You know, <clears throat> we live in a society today that that word, it is not applied biblically. We expect people to condescend. <laughs> and we look upon them uh, uh, oftentimes in society today as though uh, condescension uh, is a very negative, has a negative uh, undertone, if you will, and that we elevate ourselves at the expense of someone else's condescension. Church, I want you to understand something. Jesus Christ left glory land and took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh and he condemned sin in the flesh and he died on Calvary in order that we might live in glory. The innocent for the guilty. And in that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, but all as he came forth triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, he was crowned with glory and honor. And there is no other name in heaven or in earth by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ. We're here this morning to worship his great and his good name. I'm thankful for that that has gone before. And I pray that the Lord will bless it to resonate in your heart. And that he will bless it with his grace that you would consider these things. And, and truly strive in your life to bring forth the very best that you have every day. Every day we go to work, we bring forth the best that we have in order that we can keep our job. I'll tell you, aren't you thankful to know that you don't bring forth the best service unto, unto God in order that you might have a relationship with him, but you bring it forth because you do have the relationship with him. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to take uh, a few thoughts out of the book of Haggai. <clears throat> this is an interesting book. It's two chapters. Very minimal writing. Uh, I would submit that if the Lord were to bless, you could preach on it for months. It's a tremendous account. I want to set a little bit of the stage before you. And I trust this morning God will bless that we would consider a, a few verses in the second chapter. But I want us to consider the setting. First of all, uh, the, the children of Israel are just coming out of 70 years of Babylonian captivity. You know why they were held captive? Through disobedience. You know why we are held captive in our lives today? Through disobedience. We don't fall into a 70-year a run of captivity uh, under another uh, jurisdiction, another government, or things like that that was this circumstance with the children of Israel. But I submit to you today that there are a lot of God's people that are imprisoned uh, and in captivity because of their disobedience unto God. There's a lot of uh, illustration and, uh, uh, and type and shadow that we can uh, glean from this, and I pray that the Lord will bless it. Uh, uh, bless us to be able to keep it very close uh, to its context, but make the, uh, the applications that are of value in our lives. Here you have God's people. They've, they've just come out of Babylonian captivity, uh, and, uh, and they, they, were, uh, they were released from captivity because they repented uh, from their disobedience. They went into captivity because of disobedience. They stayed in captivity uh, because, uh, because of the judgment of God and the continuance of disobedience. They were delivered from captivity because of repentance. So part of repentance, and this is important, 
Part of repentance includes uh, the understanding of why you need to repent. You see, it's called godly sorrow in Scripture. You're not going to receive repentance unless you're sorry unto God for the disobedience that you, you stepped into. Godly sorrow works repentance. It's not like a jail sentence and you served your time and you just get out. Uh, and God doesn't just uh, uh, set it aside and forgive because statute of limitations has run out. This is the eternal God. So we get into captivity because of disobedience. We repent because of godly sorrow in our heart. We pray unto God for forgiveness. God grants the spirit of repentance. We come out of captivity with an understanding and a recollection of what got us into the captivity to begin with. So you would think that it would move you to an action of repentance. You see, getting the spirit of repentance without fruits of repentance uh, does not bring about the fullness of repentance. When we are, have a penance in heart, and God's blessed us with the sense of, of sorrow in our heart, that we would uh, uh, appeal unto Him and, and pay, uh, pray for forgiveness, and He grants it to us. And the way that you know that, by the way, is an overriding sense of peace in your heart relative to the disobedience, that God has blessed you with forgiveness. But if it doesn't change your behavior, then it's not true repentance that brings forth fruit. Does that make sense? So here you've got the children of Israel. They were blessed to come out of captivity. Uh, they they, they uh, remembered why they went into captivity, but they didn't change anything about it. They headed out, and you know the first thing they did? Instead of uh, uh, picking up and going about uh, to uh, restore the temple, to build the temple again, to, uh, to uh, uh, manifest fruits of repentance, they all ran to their own houses uh, to shore them up and build them up. We've got to get my house in order. We'll deal with the Lord's house when we get around to it. And that's what was going on in this account. Now, that's not the focus of the message this morning. <laughs> But I can't be this close to it without putting it in front of us. Because it's important that we understand that good behavior brings forth blessings in our life that are tangible, measurable, that you can look upon and you can see the outstretched hand of God before you and give Him honor, praise, and glory. That's just how it works. We don't serve God in obedience in order that he would bless, but he is faithful. Brother Thomas read uh, this morning that, in, uh, that relative to the promises of God uh, that are in him, they are yea and amen. And you know what he has said? If you will be obedient, you will eat the good of the land. That's a promise of God. Now you, don't, you do not do what you do in service to God in order that you would be blessed. Being blessed is because you're doing what God told you to do. Now, it's easy to get that out of, out of whack in our lives. And one of the things that happens when you get it out of whack, all of a sudden, uh, you, you lose the true blessing. And the true blessing is uh, in direct response of you giving God honor, praise, and glory. Because he reaches upon you and he puts his hand, as it were, upon your shoulder and says, This is my beloved child and whom I'm well pleased. And you can't beat that. There's not a steak that anybody of us, any of us can cook that's as good as the touch of the master's hand upon us that says, this is my child. Nevertheless, in obedience, we're blessed with, with blessings at the hand of the Lord. In contrast to that, Haggai uh, raises an issue. He says, consider your ways. Consider the behavior. And Brother Thomas made mention of it this morning. That we would consider the effort that we put forth in the service of the Lord. Haggai says, consider your ways. You look at your circumstance and you so much, but you bring in little. You shore up uh, 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 receptacles to, uh, to uh, house bounty and your crops fail. You see, when we're disobedient in our lives unto God, and God uh, withholds that blessing from us, it should, it's by its design to bring us to a place that we would consider our ways, get our priorities right. So we're going to leave that now. We've got that set before us. We're going to leave that, and I trust, look, at something that I believe uh, that should cause us all to rejoice in being in the service of the Lord in the experience of life today. You see, these folks, the children of Israel, they repented. And they, they rebuilt the temple. They did what God told them to do. They listened to Haggai. They listened to the prophets. They, uh, they saw uh, the circumstance of their life, and they said, no, uh, we're going to consider our ways, and we're going to get about the master's business. 
up and about the master's business. And they rebuilt the temple. So beginning in the second chapter, I want you to look at this. It says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, you know, God deals with specific. Did you know that? He just gave you the date that this happened. <laughs> he gave you the day and the month that this happened. If you don't think that God is intimately aware of what we're doing and when we're doing it and how we're doing it, think again. God, God knows all about us. He knows everything about us. And he knows uh, when it is that we, uh, that we come to a place uh, where we are considering our ways. Um, and if you don't think for a moment that it's not marked in the mind of God, think again. It's not reserved to just monumental things, if you will. It says, Now speak to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, governor of, the Ju of Judah, and to jo Joshua, the son of jo Josedek, the high priest, uh, and to the residue of the people, saying, now listen to what he says, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, Son of the Lord, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you, when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remained among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations and desire, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter, this is into verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Of hosts. Now we're going to stop reading right there. We have enough set before us that uh, if the Lord will bless this morning uh, for us to be able to consider uh, the historical account that is set before us and most importantly its application to our lives today. Because there is a direct correlation uh, to uh, the, the rebuilding of this temple and what was going on there and how God dealt with them um, in the rebuilding of the temple um, uh, uh, that was many years after uh, King Solomon was blessed uh, to raise uh, the, the most miraculous temple, a place of worship uh, unto God. It was, it was the most amazing thing that had, had taken place, the most amazing structure that had taken place uh, in the world up to that time and perhaps even to this time now we live in a time today where you know building stuff uh it's pretty amazing some of the things they, they can do i my son-in-law is an architect and he shares some stuff that is just it's mind-boggling brother john's been uh building uh, modular buildings for a number of years and the things that uh, that you see in the advancements of technology and the things that you can do um in the, the building of a structure um it's it's all inspiring it, it's just remarkable you go over to, uh, to uh, uh, Italy and you go into the Sistine Chapel and, and you see uh, the, the uh, ornateness of that building and, and the, how amazing it is and the ability that man um, has, uh, has developed, if you will, uh, to, to build something that is just uh, so appealing to the eye. It's truly breathtaking. Now, isn't that interesting? You can go into a building that has a spiritual overtone that differs from your heart of hearts theology, you might go into it thinking, I'm not going to get a thing out of this because it's just about ornateness and it doesn't line up with anything that I believe. And yet, uh, when you go, because that's how I was when I went into the thing. And I went in there and I, and I had to catch my breath. I had to catch my breath. It was amazing. And it stopped you in your tracks. It kind of answers the question, why God told Solomon to build the temple exactly as he told Solomon to build the temple. You see, God's worthy of the very best that we have. He's, he's worthy of, of never taking a shortcut. He's worthy of doing things exactly as he's told us to do them. And when Solomon was blessed to build that temple, you know, David wanted to build the temple, didn't he? David really wanted to. 
It, he, he, it was his heart's desire that he build the temple. And it was forbidden for him to build the temple uh, uh, because of, of, of the sin that was in David's life. And God forbade him to build the temple. But he kept the promise uh, that he had made unto David uh, that through his lineage that temple would be built. And his son Solomon was blessed of the Lord to erect this amazing temple where God blessed and occupied with the children of Israel for that time. We're going to look at it just briefly in a minute. But there's a couple of thoughts that I want to set before you before we do. Here in the book of Haggai, in the, in the third verse, it says, uh, and this is a wonderful thing. And, you know, sometimes in the church today, you live in the church your, your whole life. You've been in the church uh, however many years. I don't know how many years are represented in the membership that's here today of how many years collectively we've been in the church. I would submit hundreds of years we've been in the church when you add them all up together. So we've seen a little bit. We've seen changes in the church. Uh, we've seen ups and downs, and we've seen blessings and times of, of famine, if you will. Uh, we've seen a lot of things in the church, and it's easy much of the time uh, in our carnal nature to enter into a comparative analysis. That's very easy to do. I find myself as a pastor of the church looking back um, at the church um, here even in this location um, and then looking collectively at uh, the Baptists in California and, and calling to my mind and memory of the pastors that served uh, the churches and it seemed uh, that in many respects uh, that things were, were better then than they are now. Uh, but then when I look at it prayerfully, I see that there are things that are better now than there were then. One of the challenges that we have is to uh, uh, allow ourselves to step in uh, to a comparative analysis uh, and draw conclusion uh, in our experience and then make decisions based upon those conclusions. Very dangerous thing to do. I'll tell you, living a life of comparison is a trap. Is a trap. Avoid it. Now that does not say, do not look, uh, whether it be good or evil. God's given you the ability to discern uh, what is good and what is evil. You've got a witness within your heart of hearts uh, that will tell you, and the conscience that you have, it'll convict you and it'll bless you. That's not comparison. That's just simply obeying uh, the voice of the Lord that resides within you. That's not comparison. I'll tell you, there is no comparison between good and evil. I trust you would agree with that. There's no comparison. It's either good or it's evil. Uh, God says in Scripture that we should seek the good and that we should abandon the evil. It, it's not that we would compare the two and then make a decision. Well, you know, I remember when James was a little guy. He was ro raised, uh, growing up and, and he was a peculiar kid, always thinking about stuff. Oh, he had a frown on his brow uh, since he was just a little guy. It seemed like he was always thinking about something. And I remember him growing up uh, and, and we would tell him, uh, son, you are not allowed to do this because if you do... This is what's going to happen. And I could see the wheels turning in that little boy's head. Hmm, that might be worth it. That might just be worth the trouble that I'm going to get in uh, because I really want to do this. Uh, they, listen, there is no comparison between good and evil. The only choice in that is to do good. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said. But... But entering a comparison, a life of comparison, will cause you, it'll trip you up, it'll ensnare you, it'll cause you to make decisions uh, about things that you do and, and uh, bring about uh, uh, ideas that you have of what other, other people are doing, and it's a trap. Avoid it. Absolutely avoid it. That same thing goes, Paul says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the joy that, with the glory that shall be revealed in us. He says, don't compare the two, the sufferings and the glory. The Bible speaks of sufferings and glory throughout the entirety of the life of Jesus Christ. I, I want you to know we should see the sufferings to know what he did for us, but focus upon the glory. Because you have that glory. You go in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Uh, 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 Paul talks there in covenant language. Everything's in past tense. Even glorified. We have the glory within us. We shouldn't compare the two. Uh, here in the book of Haggai it says, Who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Church, understand that uh, we are blessed of the Lord uh, to see things, not with the natural eye, but through an eye of faith. Through an eye of faith. 
And when you're looking at stuff through an eye of faith, you can see invisible things. You can see things that are not visible uh, to the natural eye. Uh, that first temple was beautiful. It was arrayed uh, uh, like none other. Let's go to 1 Kings in the 6th chapter. And I want to spend uh, a little bit of time this morning, God willing... Uh, looking at this to set this uh, before us. I think there's some wonderful lessons uh, for us to glean if the Lord uh, will, will bless us to, to stay on track and move, move through this. In the sixth chapter uh, of 1 Kings, we find um, it says, and it came in the first verse, and it came to pass in the 480th year of the children of Israel uh, were come out of the land of Egypt. When did it happen? It came, it happened 480 years after the children of Israel left Egyptian bondage. Uh, why is that important? Because God said it's important and that we would understand that it, all that time uh, was in the waiting of the building of this temple. And it, it marked a very special time uh, in the lives of the children of Israel and a very special time uh, where the Lord is concerned. It says, uh, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month uh, Ziph, uh, which is a sec the second month, so the month of February, according to how we look at stuff, uh, that he began to build the house of the Lord. I wonder if today we would say, you know, August, August the 5th, 2018. I heard this message from a young man talking about effort. And it caused me to think about it for a minute, about my effort. August 5th, 2018. That's the day that I start thinking about the effort I'm putting forth into the service of the Lord. And that day is going to be a marked day in my mind, in my heart, in my service unto God. You, if you don't think that God knows our thoughts before we have them, He does. And He certainly knows them when we have them. And then He certainly looks at them and expects uh, uh, there to be a connection between what we do and what we think and what we say. It's the timing is, is there's not anything in scripture that's there to fill space. It's there with purpose. Look at what, what happens here. And the house which King Solomon uh, built for the Lord, the length thereof was three score cubits. I'm not going to read all of this. This is a big place. Now, if I, if I have understanding about it, a cubit is about a foot and a half. So you can do the math. You can look at it. And I would encourage you to read the coming chapters uh, in 1 Kings here and see uh, some of the specifics uh, that were in that temple and how grand it was. Look at the cherubims. I, I believe it says they were, they were 10 cubits in, or 9 cubits in height. Just the cherubims uh, that stood against the wall with their wings touching each other uh, and they all were overlaid in gold uh, and how uh, ornate and beautiful and majestic that it was. And you say, that, that's amazing. I've seen something just like it. No, you haven't. <laughs> no, you haven't. There's, we're going to read something here in a minute that, that astonished me and I trust it will you. Matter of fact, let's read it now. Look at the seventh verse. Talking about the structure of this house. And this house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready. Before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron herd in the house while it was in building. I want you to think about that. Now, <clears throat> I was in a period of some disobedience in my life when this building was built. I had a small part in it. I wasn't around near like some of you other brethren that were here that uh, Brother John fell through the roof and different things going on. I mean, there was a lot of hammering, a lot of sawing. Uh, there was a lot of racket in the building of this structure. That's what happens when we, according to our own natural abilities, uh, when we uh, erect a structure, uh, we, even if it's a structure uh, that is by its design uh, to be occupied by the saints of God in worship and service unto God. Uh, uh, man's, uh, listen, man is noisy. Plain and simple. We're just noisy. We make a lot of racket. And while this temple, in all its glory, and all of its grandeur, in the entirety of the building of this temple, there was not heard a hammer. There was not heard uh, a, a, any tool of iron. There was no chisel being heard. There was no racket. 
You know what you see in this, what I see in this, every stone that was hewn was hewn away from the structure and it was carried in. You see, when we're building our spiritual habitation, you see, you all have, we all have a building. <laughs> we all have a building. Your life of discipleship is a temple unto the Lord. No, you're not. You're not your own. You're the temple of God. You. We're, we're built up a spiritual house. We have a house in heaven not made with hands, let alone tools. <laughs> but your life of discipleship, your spiritual habitation, the Holy Spirit has hewn out those stones. You didn't hew them out yourself. There's a lot of, of God's people that will live with him in glory uh, right now that are endeavoring uh, to construct their life of service unto the Lord, uh, their, their life of position uh, in the eyes of God. Uh, I, can, I can exercise the hammer of faith. Um, I can use the saw of obedience, if you will. Um, I, can, I can use the chisel of baptism in order to bring myself uh, into a, a place of spiritual habitation before the Lord. Not so. Not so. I don't know if this put, gives you pause like it did me. I, I, hadn't, I, I, I had read before <laughs> this verse, but it hit me like a ton of bricks this morning. Everything, everything that was in this temple and all of its grandeur and all of its glory was prepared and then brought in. And listen, laid in place exactly as God had ordained it. You see, we're not at liberty to bring man's devices into the temple church. We're not at liberty to bring things into the church. We're only at liberty to use what's God given us and put it in place where he told us to put it in the church. We don't need auxiliaries. We don't need things of the world in order that we would be a temple, a holy temple, uh, sanctified by God, that we would offer praise and, and glory unto his name. What we need is to put in place to the best of our ability uh, and striving forth uh, to do exactly what God has told us to do and occupy uh, our appointed place as he has intended us to occupy it. And when we do that, the building has great glory. Great glory. It says, 12th verse, concerning this house, the first house, the house that Solomon built, concerning this house, I'm going to bounce through this because time will not allow us to cover all of it. Concerning this house, which thou art in building, if... Thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them. Then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. The first house, the first temple was a house of contingency. That's what it was. If you do this, as I've commanded you, then I will do this. You know, there are people that base their theology upon that today. If I do this, then God will do this. This, this right here um, is talking about uh, 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 Solomon behaving in obedience unto the Lord uh, to build a place of worship uh, that God had promised, if you do it as I have said, I will come and I will commune with you. I will come and have special fellowship uh, with you. And church, if we do what we're supposed to do in the church, uh, putting forth the best that we have uh, uh, unto God uh, with the, the single intent of worshiping him, he's promised to come. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Now the principle, the primary application of that is dealing uh, with uh, personal offense one with another. But understand this, the principle of it is the same when we have come together and met together in the name of Jesus Christ. If you've come in my name, I'll meet with you. It says, I will dwell and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people 
Israel. Now, it says uh, here that Solomon built the house uh, and he finished it. Now, I want to move down through this, uh, and I just want you, and I would encourage you, and I'm not going to do it uh, this morning. Time will just absolutely get away with uh, from us. But I would encourage you to read through the 6th uh, and the 7th chapter, um, and you'll find, first of all, uh, that uh, uh, this building, this first temple, was seven years in the building. Seven years. Caltrans would have taken 30. Seven years in the building. And then Solomon built his own house. And that was 13 years in the building. And that house was positioned so that he could structure the things that went in to the first house. And I will tell you, read through this. The, the building of this in the detail it is amazing. To understand that the stones were put in place, they were hewn out, they were put exactly where they, they had to be in order for the integrity of the house to stand. They were hewn out. So you couldn't take a, a haphazard stone from here and put it over here. They had to go where they belonged. You say that had to have been beautiful. Well, I'm sure it was until uh, Solomon followed the commandments of the Lord um, and, uh, and, and then took the, uh, the cedar wood and overlaid it. <laughs> Hit it. Don't get to see it. And then he took and he overlaid the cedar wood that overlaid the stones that were hewn out with solid gold. It says here in, in the um, in the 21st, so Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold and the whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished the, all the house. Can you imagine how this thing had to look? It had to have been absolutely glorious. I have good news for you this morning. When God looks at his house of occupation today, when he looks at you, this house doesn't even compare to the glory and the beauty that God sees in his house. When you've come and you are met pleading nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ, and God looks through that blood and he sees you not as forgiven, not as if, if you do this, then I will. He sees you as righteous before him, as his righteous child. And the beauty that, that he beholds exceeds the glory of this house. As wonderful as it was. Listen, for many years, God communed with his people in this house. And you go and read through this, and I'm, man, I'm skipping some good stuff uh, throughout all of this, but go and read in, in the 8th chapter and, and, in, and toward into the ninth when, when, when you hear Solomon, the King Solomon, as the house is completed and he's begging unto God, God, if you will hear in heaven, then forgive. Solomon is saying, we, I know we're going to sin. And I know you said you'll occupy with us as we're obedient. But I know we're going to dis be disobedient. So God, would you please, when we pray, when we beg forgiveness, will you hear in heaven and forgive? Over and over and over and over and over again, Solomon prays this prayer in order that God's presence would remain with them in, in that temple and that they would feel uh, the presence of God. Inside this temple uh, was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside this temple was the table uh, uh, for the shoe bread. Inside this temple were the candlesticks. Um, inside this temple was the incense that burned up unto God as a sweet-smelling savor. Inside this temple was the Holy of Holies that only uh, the high priest could go into. Inside this place. Is where God, the scripture refers to it as Shekinah glory. In the Holy of Holies, it was pitch black. It was completely dark. And the high priest would go in there and he would have blood for his sins. And he would have blood for the sins of his people. And he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat in pitch darkness. And only when the Shekinah glory of God came in communion... Was there any light in that place?
And that's when those that were on the porch outside heard the bells in his, in his robe. And they knew God had come. And he, he had forgiven. And this happened over and over and over. And God repeatedly communed with his people in this place. I hope I'm setting it before you to the point that you could see how valuable this place was to these people. These are your brothers and sisters. <laughs> these are church folk. This is, this is the, the people of God. that They were worshiping God in this place. And can you just imagine having a place like that? And yet, it was a place that was built on contingency. It, they were never able to forget that they couldn't keep the law, they, that they were reliant on sacrifices in order that God would roll that forward, in order that God uh, would not leave their presence. Can you imagine? I'll tell you, you talk about putting forth effort. <laughs> you go over to the book of Hebrews, and, and, uh, and the Apostle Paul speaks there of those who died without mercy before the law of God. When they put forth just a little less effort than they should have, then and entered into disobedience. This was, was the, this is how they occupied. And now back to the book of Haggai, we find a different setting. A different setting. Time is, is spent for me to give you the contrast. So if you want more of a contrast, you go get it. Because <laughs> it's there. It's there for you. Listen to this. Because I want to spend the rest of our time with this. Fourth verse. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land. Saith the, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. You're making a comparison. You're looking at that old temple, and you're saying what we've got today doesn't even remotely compare. It's a shack compared uh, to uh, the house that Solomon built. We don't have anything today. And the Lord says, not so. Be strong, for I'm with you. What do we have in our lives of service unto the Lord today? What do we have? We have the felt presence of God is what we have. And he's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He'll be with us in the sixth trouble, and in the seventh shall no evil overtake. He will be with you all the way to death. He's promised. And by the way, you heard it read. His promises are yea and amen. He's promised to be with you. Take courage. God's presence should bring courage in our life. We should draw strength from it. And it should motivate us. The love of Christ constraineth us. That's what Paul told the church at Corinth. That's not just a, a, a confining love. It does constrain us uh, from uh, stepping into things that our carnality might want to, to move forward. But it is a compelling love. It should move us to service unto God. It says here, take courage. I will be with you. I am with you. Verse 5, according to the word that I have covenanted with you. When ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. God's covenant with his people should remove all fear. What do we got to be afraid of? What are we afraid of today? Well, I'm afraid that the church isn't going to carry on. Really? You, you, do you think anybody in, your, in the past looked at the church and said, I just don't think that the church is going to last. I don't think it's going to be here. You know, they've been preaching the death of the Primitive Baptist Church uh, probably since its inception. Guess what? It's going to be in existence in the world when, God, when Christ Jesus comes back. There will be a people worshiping him in spirit and in truth, uh, whole, singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, there will be God's people worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Uh, they, I believe they should be called <clears throat> primitive Baptists. Uh, that could be the case with effort in our life. Uh, but understand this, God's people will be here worshiping him in spirit and in truth when he comes back. Fear not. 
little flock. Now, I want it to be right here. I want it to be in Das Palos. I want it to be a glorious kingdom. I want it to be in Lindsay. I want it to be in Houston, Bellflower, Santa Paula. You name it. I want it to be there. And it can be there. If we'll step into the strength and the power of God and listen to his voice and not let fear be the governor of our actions. He has covenanted with us. By the way, he can't break a promise. He can't lie, and he can't die, and he can't deny himself. He can't break a promise, and he has promised. So what do we have to be afraid of? We should move in his service. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Can't happen. Won't happen. If it happens in this location, um, it's because uh, God's people failed. Not God. Not God. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens. Boy, I tell you, here lately I've, I've, I've tried to get God to hear my prayer that he would just shake the heavens and the earth. There's a lot of stuff in the world today that needs shaking up. You know what? <clears throat> Brother Arville Charles said this a number of months ago, maybe over a year now relative to the society in which we live and the deterioration of it and the way that things are, are going, uh, that if there's going to be repentance uh, in the United States of America, if there's going to be healing, it's going to come through the church. Amen and amen. Why? Because the church is, is how God communicates with His people. It's, it's how God comes and fellowships and communes and communicates through the preaching of the gospel. And it's got to be his unadulterated gospel. It's not the gospel that's preached out in the world uh, that allows you to come and go as you will. Uh, do this a little here and do this a little. Uh, it's got to be thus saith the Lord. And when we recognize that, we take courage. And we realize that the God we're here to worship today uh, can shake the earth and shake the heavens. He did it one day. You know, the, the earth quaked and the graves were opened up. I'll tell you what, God got everybody's attention that day. <laughs> and he's able to do it today. But I would submit to you that even in a smaller scale, he could shake things in the church. And you know how he does it? One member at a time. Shake things. Blesses you with spiritual renewal. You have a recommitted effort unto God. And you share with one another. And it brings revival in the kingdom. Revival is not a collective experience. Revival begins with one. And it, and it grows from there. Oh, let the revival start with me. With me. Not that I would receive glory, but Lord, let me recommit myself. Shake the heavens and the earth in my life that I might know that my strength is in thy hand. And I will shake all nations, all of them. By the way, there's a drop in a bucket before God. Nations, the nations of the world, we get all up in arms. There is a drop in the bucket before God. I will shake all nations, and the desires of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Church, we need to be faithful. We need to be patient. And our eye needs to be fixed upon the glory of God. And not be distracted and worried about stuff that God can just with a thought erase from the scene. You have to recognize who is our Father. Who He is. And what it means to be His child. He loves you enough that he sent his only begotten son to die 
on the cross of Calvary in your stead. He loves you that much. Don't you think that he loves you enough to prosper you in your life? To take care of the things that are going on? To address your concerns and your needs? And to bless you with the spirit of peace and contentment that you would live a life of prosperity and service unto him? Or that you would give honor, praise, and glory to his name? Don't you think he loves you that much? You know he does. Sometimes we don't behave that way. But he does. We need to be patient and faithful and wait for the manifestation of the glory of God. Let me finish these next two verses. I've got a minute for each of them. The silver is mine. And the gold is mine. Saith the Lord of hosts. We sang a song this morning by design. <laughs> I'm a child of the king. Do we believe that? Do we believe we're a child of the king? I hope you believe it this morning. Because you are, whether you believe it or not. And the silver is all his. And the gold's all his. What do you need? What do you need in your life? If God's your father, and he's a loving father, this is not an if of doubt, this is an if of reason, because he is. Sometimes we don't believe it. Sometimes we don't act that way. But those things being true, is he not faithful to attend unto your needs and to bless you with that that you stand in need of? And you know what we all need more than anything? It's not the riches of this world. We need peace and we need contentment. That's what we need. Because with that as a backdrop in our lives, praise and worship is so much easier to offer up. Because we have a stable, a stableness ab about us. And we have a platform from which to offer praise unto God. And it's no coincidence that the last verse that I'm going to read to you again. Listen to this. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. This is God's words. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former. Obviously, he's not talking about ornateness, is he? He's not talking about gold-plated things. He's not talking about grandeur from a natural perspective. He's talking about something far greater than that. And I submit to you this morning, it resides right within you. Right where you're sitting this morning. No, you're not. You are not your own. You're the temple of the Lord. You're the place where he resides. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory that you have within far exceeds the glory of the former house. Certainly that glory will house you in heaven when time is no more. But church, that first temple was a militant temple. And we have a responsibility in our lives today to live our lives as the temple of the Lord. Recognizing you're not your own. You have been bought with a price. And it was a great price. But it is the shedding of that blood <clears throat> that elevates the glory of this house more than the former house. It's that blood. And what did it do? What did the shedding of that blood do? He tells us, the glory of those latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. You know what the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ did? It brought peace between God and you. Positional peace. There is no more enmity between God and you. There is no more contingency where that is concerned. He looks at you uh, through the blood of Christ as a righteous child. Now, sometimes this righteous child misbehaves. And I'm deserving of a whipping. And God loves me enough that he gives it to me. 
And it isn't fun when I'm receiving it. But if I am patient through the enduring of it, recognizing he is my loving father, it brings about a peaceable fruit at the end. And it blesses me to know that I have a father who loves me enough, loves me enough to help govern my life that I would be found walking worthy of the vocation wherewith I am called. God bless you this morning. Trust and said something that would stir your pure minds and that God would <clears throat> add his grace to the preaching of his word. Publish an open door to the church this morning. There's one here that cares to unite with the church. Come forward if you want to know. 302. What number? 302. <clears throat> number 302. That's Sam is saying 302. Give one another the right hand of Christian fellowship. <clears throat> 302. Dear Lord, divine in thee, I find new strength for every day. Oh, lose my time.